programs. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, uh, today here with the ones that came before, we have an interview with the author of The Magus Conspiracy, uh, Kate Hartfield. Kate, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Very happy to be here. That's great. And great to have you. Um, so uh, just wanting to start off, um, I know I, I did a little bit of research uh, prior to our call. I know that you have been a multiple finalist for Canada's Aurora uh, Award. Um, you recently became a Sunday's Time bestseller for the Embroidered Book, which is your latest release prior to this one, which is coming out here in August and later in October um, from the information I have. Mm -hmm. You used to be a uh, journalist and editor for the Ottawa Citizen, um, and then, of course, you have your degree in uh, political science and a master's in journalism, so you definitely have a lot of kind of historical and kind of political background um, for a book like this. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so uh, just kind of starting off, um, I wanted to um, – Start with something you had said in an interview you did with the Second Life Book Club about Assassin's Creed being big in your household. Uh, can mm -hmm. you tell us more about the history that you have with the series? Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, and uh, I'm just so happy to be talking about it. And thank you so much for your enthusiasm and support. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's really exciting to be sort of um, you know uh, talking with fans about this and and uh, just joining this canon so um yeah so as you can tell i'm excited and <laughs> I, I have a lot of uh, enthusiasm for the games and for the universe um so my personal history with assassin's creed is that uh yeah my i have a 12 year old kid uh and a partner and uh all three of us are gamers so um you know we're quite frequently in our little introvert cor corners of the house each uh, uh on a game of some kind uh, I have played uh, Syndicate and I've played um, a little bit of Origins and uh, I'm currently working my way through AC2 at the moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've watched my kid play even more Assassin's Creed. So there have been many, many hours where I've been sitting in the living room doing some work uh, and he's been playing Assassin's Creed on, uh, on PS4. And uh, my partner also plays and I watch him sometimes as well. So between the three of us, I've probably at least watched most of the games we played. <laughs> And it's funny you you uh, you note about um, playing through Assassin's Creed Two. Um, you also did some work with. Um, I'll make sure I have that name right. Um, where did I put it? Uh, oh no! <laughs> Apologies. Oh no problem. Here we go. Choice of gaming uh, with mm -hmm. the Magicians Workshop, um, which I downloaded and played uh, the first chapter. Definitely very interesting. But have you found any influence for the writing that you did with that from Assassin's Creed 2 or vice versa? Have you noticed a lot of your personal choices for how you describe the characters or the historical figures with how they're represented uh, in Assassin's Creed 2? Um. I, I hadn't played Assassin's Creed 2 before I wrote the Magician's Workshop, so I didn't have, um, I didn't really have any connection from that direction. So, it, but it's interesting now having written it because the Magician's Workshop is set in, in Florence in um, 1512. Uh, and so, yeah, so it's really interesting now, um, you know, seeing, uh, seeing those characters and, and that setting. And, you know, one of the things that I love about all Assassin's Creed games is the, um, the immersiveness of the setting. And so feeling like you're, you're there in a way that um, interactive fiction um, interactive fiction kind of immerses you in a different way and really uh, you know emphasizes agency and everything else, but uh, it doesn't have that visual element that um, a video game has, of course. True, but I do think back to because um, of course I have read the Magus Conspiracy mm -hmm. or Magus Conspiracy, and we have already put out a review for it on the Once Came Before website. Um, you actually had talked about. Uh, in one of your previous interviews about not being able to represent the the scale or the scope of the game visually, um, but that you do have uh, stronger – you have your own strengths in, in your writing mm -hmm. for the book. But I do think back to how you, you wrote the, the training scene. Uh, with the scaling of the cathedral mm -hmm. um, and 
I very much could picture everything from scaling up the side of the spire for the cathedral and then being able to look over uh, look over the city. So I do think that you you did a good uh, you, you did represent it very well. Um, but oh, I can you. definitely understand like being able to look over from the you know the Arc de Triomphe and look over Paris mm -hmm. and see you know all of the roads kind of scaling out. But I do find that a lot of writers, including yourself, have been able to provide that grand scope and feeling of you know holy crap I'm standing on top of the Eiffel Tower or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I do feel like you you did have success in doing that. In speaking mm -hmm. to um, the various mechanics of the game, such as the synchronization points like that, um, I also recognize that you were able to implement things like side quests as well as um, adapting the challenges um, from – it reminds me very similar to uh, – games like Assassin's Creed Unity and Assassin's Creed Valhalla where you have a an assassination um, as an example but you have multiple ways of running it but seeing your characters kind of um, kind of looking around the room and figuring out okay what do I have to my disposal what can I do and then following through uh, how do you decide what mechanics to include or write about that were in the games yeah that's that's really interesting and it was definitely a deliberate strategy on my part to think uh okay how can i take what's cool about playing assassin's creed games and um not really replicate that in prose because it's not the same format but um create that same sense of excitement and that same sense of immersion and uh and uh the choice as you say of, of the feeling of having um sort of side quests and and multiple plots happening at the same time and and it all coming together um so, yeah, so I thought about, um, and you know, and I didn't want to make it um, too mechanical either because, you know, that could be quite annoying in prose if you had, you know, sort of like, oh, here's my weapons inventory or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, just wouldn't wouldn't work the same way in a novel as it does in a game. Um, so, and in fact, my editor had to pull me back from that a few times because he, he noted that I would keep saying exactly what kind of knife it was or exactly what kind of gun it was and, and that kind of thing and eventually he was like you know you don't have to give us the entire you know serial number every every time <laughs> so uh so I, I think i had maybe a little too much of that in mind um but yeah i was thinking about all of those aspects of a game and um you know and i and i did want things like like weaponry to be there though and to be important and to mm -hmm. think about okay what how could they reflect the personality um, of each of the main characters, like which kind of knife would they choose, you know, for example, in the same way that you make that choice when you're putting together your character uh, in a game. So that was definitely top of mind. And would you say that was the same uh, process or thought process that you had when choosing which books for Simeon specifically to study mm -hmm. um, while he was going through his apprenticeship? Because I've never seen in any of the transmedia or the games so far outside of Assassin's Creed Revelations because they did have bookshops where you would purchase specific tomes. Mm -hmm. um, did you specifically pinpoint those books that you wanted him to read or mm -hmm. was it something that you – like what, what was your process with that decision? Yeah, uh, that was lots of fun and uh... – I think what I wanted to do with the the reading list that Simeon has. So Simeon, you know, is the main character, one of the two main characters in the book, and uh, he's um, a soldier, and he has a sort of a, a, an unconventional education. Um, you know, we we learned early on that he was quite bright, and uh, you know, was um, taken into a rich person's house early on to be educated, but it didn't work out, and so he has a sort of a patchwork of education. And then he meets his mentor, who um, is an interesting character in his own right. And um, so the the reading list uh, of books that uh, that Cain provides for Simeon to read, um, I, I wanted them to reflect what I thought a, an assassin's education um, should be or could mm -hmm. be about. And so it's a sort of a mix of different things. So you have um, very traditional uh, fighting manuals. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there are these traditions of uh, German and Italian um, and French uh, manuals for swordplay and for wrestling and that kind of thing. And so I thought, well, it would be really cool to draw on that really old tradition 
um, you know, because the Brotherhood itself would have been around for so long. And so that it might have incorporated a lot of those traditions of those old fighting manuals. Um, but then also um, a sort of Renaissance man approach to understanding the world. And so there's fiction in there. Um, you know, there's philosophy, mm-hmm. um, you know, so it, it is a, a bit of a grab bag of uh, of different things that I thought an assassin should know, but it's also reflecting the personality of the teacher that's assigning them as well. Right, right. And Kane definitely is a very, a very enriched personality. Um, mm-hmm. Definitely a favorite character of mine. Uh, and then, of course, um, and I've, I've, I've always had confusion pronouncing her name. Is it Pierrette? Yeah, Pierrette, yeah. Pierrette, okay. Yeah. Um, and her and the, her work with the circus and even just the descriptions of the – the different stages of the show that they're performing and how she's coming up with her new performances and stuff to top herself and, um, and how that rolls into her meeting Ada uh, Loveless, who is, I would say the key historical character um, leading into this new trilogy that you have um, mm-hmm. going forward. And with your research process, cause I know that you have a lot of personal, enjoyment of the 18th hundreds um you know 19th century and of course in europe um due to your personal lineage and such um but when you're deciding the history that you want to explore were you taking like this is the historical timeline for this period and then here are some blanks that i can fill in fictional characters or Mm -hmm. was it more of here's the idea of what i want to do let me find what period or what uh, events in history would fill into this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for us, it it really started with the period. So, um, you know, Aconite and Ubisoft had um, had an idea that they wanted uh, they wanted a trilogy set in this period, and um, that the you know um, and sort of so they started working with me about well, how could we um, how could we develop something in this period, and um, what are some of the things that that would interest us in terms of what the assassins of Templars are up to at this time? Um, so we did start with a sort of basic idea of the time and place uh, that it would be probably Europe and um, and at this time. And I think one of the things that really stood out, um, I know, to my editors at Aconite um, was that the 19th century had a lot of political assassinations that uh, you know. Um, every monarch had at least one attempt on their life and, and, you know, several of them were actually killed and you had the rise of anarchism and of course, rise of Marxism and um, the revolutions in 1848. And so there was just a lot of political ferment happening. Uh, And with those assassinations, it seems like an obvious thing to ask the question of, um, you know, are the assassins behind them? Are they not behind them? Um, You know, what would be their relationship to the brotherhood uh, and to the Templars? Um, so it really did begin with that question of, okay, let's look at what's happening at the time. And then from there, um, you know, it was sort of, a um, finding different elements in the history that, um, I thought kind of, um, fed in thematically to what I wanted to talk mm-hmm. about. Uh, but, but also there was a little bit of that sense of, you know, that's another thing that, that people love in the games is the opportunity to have those cameos with historical figures and to interact with those people. Um, and so that's another thing that I wanted to kind of replicate in the novel. Yeah, and the the cameos is definitely um, I, I I like the way that you described that because when you had first introduced some of the Templar opposition um, for myself, I'm like, okay, this is very obvious. This is going to be a historical figure, and I would go and research each character. Uh, or each figure as they appeared to see, okay, is this person real? Is this person real? Is this person real? And, uh, you know, funny enough, um, we had discussed on uh, on Twitter um, how one of the characters, um, I'm not going to note the name because I don't want to spoil it, had mm-hmm. been influenced by the name of an actual writer of the mm-hmm. time period. Um, so I was like, okay, well, that that's like I could see it fitting. Uh, it would make mm-hmm. sense to me, but um, it was – it definitely opened up my eyes, um, and as I was researching, I would actually even at points identify other characters that had not yet come into the book, and then when they showed up, I'm like, oh, okay, that's that person, uh, mm-hmm. and so it made a little bit more sense, uh, specifically 
thinking of the the butcher um mm-hmm. and and how he came into play which that scene um with him mm-hmm. rushing towards what was happening mm-hmm. um you know again without spoiling i thought was a extremely strong scene because i'm like oh no something's going down and mm-hmm. then you see what happens and i'm like oh okay here we go uh we're <laughs> in, we're in it <laughs> um so uh yeah. So did Aconite approach you directly about this? Or was was something you had to apply for? Um, it came about through my agent. So um, it was one of those things where my agent knew the opportunity was there and, mm-hmm. you know, thought I might be a fit for it because I have, uh, you know, I've written a lot of historical settings right. and I'm really interested in, um, in historical, you know, sort of alt history and, and that kind of writing is typically what I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I have, um, you know, a little bit of background in interactive fiction and game writing as well. And so she thought, you know, yeah, this seems like it might be a good fit for you if you're interested. So at that point, um, I developed some pitches for Aconite and uh, they liked them. And then we started working on an outline and went back and forth on that a bit. Uh, so it was really a sort of collaborative process uh, right from the beginning. And did you collaborate with the Ubisoft team, the 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 game historians and such to work along with fitting in this into the assassin's creed universe yeah um it was really uh you know i haven't written um tie-in writing like this before for uh for any property and so i wasn't sure what to expect in that regard and i found it really uh wonderful and freeing and supportive the way that that works so um you know they would sort of provide uh information and say you know here's where you could find the things that you need to know and um you know, sort of here are a few things we want to make sure that you're aware of, you know, um, in terms of, of writing, but I was already quite familiar with the universe anyway. So, uh, so that part of it, I felt pretty confident in, uh, and then it was just a matter of just, you know, uh, when we, uh, would work on an outline, um, uh, or the manuscript itself, you know, just running things past people at Ubisoft, uh, at various stages of the process to make sure there was nothing that, I was unaware of that would step on somebody else's toes uh, or something like that. Uh, and I would kind of just flag little things and say, you know, like just, just, you know, please note this part of it is um, related to canon from another game or, or just something like that. just so that people would be aware that I was throwing in those Easter eggs or whatever. And I know that, and I, I went back and and went through my notes for the book. I know that you're very big on representation in your writing. Um, mm-hmm. Especially, I think back to the, the magician's workshop with the ability of choosing not only how do you present yourself as far as um, gender, um, but also with your pronouns. And um, uh, I, I, I couldn't remember and I couldn't re identify because I wasn't really sure how I was searching the book itself for it. Um, but um, were there any specific characters in the Magus Conspiracy or the Magus Conspiracy that were um, original characters that you had made, or characters based off of history? Because um, I know that you have said in the past that you go off of the writings about the historical figure to try to identify things like sexuality and whatnot mm-hmm. um, before just making assumptions or just. Uh, you know, fictionalizing a, an actual person, but um, were there any uh, original characters that you had added for some form of representation in a game that's very, very heavily marketed towards a more male audience? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, it is something that I think about, I think at every stage. So I try to keep it in mind all the time. And, you know, there's always, um, you know, a little bit of a, um attention between you know you kind of want to don't write outside of your lane or uh you know write things without thinking that um that you haven't properly researched or haven't done the homework for and that kind of thing so um you know uh, i'm conscious of that as well um but i i am trying to kind of represent um all kinds of people in my writing and uh consider the kinds of people who who have been present throughout history, but maybe haven't had as many stories told about them and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, and I, again, you know, felt nothing but support from Ubisoft and Aconite uh, in that regard as well. Um, so yeah, and definitely I was aware that, you know, um, with gaming in general, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, I wouldn't say maybe the majority, but there's a certainly a significant, you know, male audience. Uh, and I have a, a, a strong female character in this book. 
Um, there's uh, one um, sort of minor side character who is um, non-binary, although they wouldn't have that word uh, to describe themselves mm -hmm. probably in the 19th century, but um, but they are actually based on um, a small note about a, a circus performer that I actually found and thought, ah, oh, you know, I'll steal that from history. There's there's a, a circus performer who was billed as being, you know, neither men nor women. And I thought, okay, well, they're going in the book. Um, and, uh, you know, so I do, whenever I find those things in history uh, where the people have maybe not, um, have been forgotten a little bit, uh, I think, okay, well, I'll put them in the book. And, um, and that way we can have a little bit more of a complete representation. Yeah, and I think that's that's great. And I I always I've found myself becoming more and more um, almost wanting of things like that because we, you know, a lot of the history that at least I might I'll, I'll talk to myself personally mm -hmm. was taught was very just kind of factual like that you didn't get anything below the surface level of who this person was what did they do mm -hmm. uh, unless you wanted to go and read a book that somebody had done the research and went through all of their journals and learned about oh this person may have had um you know attractions to this or whatnot but mm -hmm. I love that your work as well as the work that Ubisoft has been starting to produce are introducing more and more characters like that. We had one in Assassin's Creed Valhalla for the uh, introductory to the um, uh, the Ireland expansion um, mm -hmm. with a uh, with a non-binary character, and I, th mm -hmm. I thought that was great. Uh, or I'm sorry, a gender fluid character. My mistake. Um, um, but I I think the more and more representation because. Yes, the, it is a primarily um, boys club of sorts with video gaming, but it isn't all just that. Um, of course, with the Assassin's Creed Sisterhood and all of the um, various people that we have in part of our community as far as just gaming in general and producing a game, working on transmedia um, that is – kind of expanding more and more to show people the rest of what's going on with the world. But I think that that's great. And I, I can't wait to see more um, mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. um, have you had a chance to look at any of the other transmedia that Assassin's Creed has put out yet? Um, I have not, uh, not all of it by any means. Um, but uh, I did, I got myself a few books, a few of the novels because mm -hmm. I wanted to get a sense for like what an Assassin's Creed novel um, is like. So uh, I have, um, I think I have two of the Oliver Bowden novels and um, I have Elsa Hunison's uh, novel that just came out, uh, Sword of the White Horse. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I've read a few of the books um, and um, I've taken a quick look at, um, I'm trying to remember which uh, of the graphic novels that it was. But uh, yeah, so I've, I've just I've been aware of a few things, but I haven't, uh, I feel like there's a lot out there that I haven't seen yet. And I, I, I like that you brought up the graphic novels because mm -hmm. one of the things that fans had had some kind of disappointment with um, was the way that the graphic novels had kind of taken the modern day story post the Ezio collection uh, mm -hmm. with Desmond Miles um, and Assassin's Creed 3. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of the modern day uh, story had moved to and even ended in the comics. Um, and much like the other books that Aconite has published and Oliver has written, there mm -hmm. isn't a lot of modern day in the books themselves because they are just novelizing the specific history of that game or in cases like yours and Elsa's and um uh in the case of y'all's mm -hmm. um uh oh in Kirby's that's what it was mm -hmm. for Gearman's uh saga mm -hmm. um there uh there hasn't been any modern day yet are we expecting to see some modern day later on in the trilogy or are we staying specifically in the historical setting um, not everything's written in stone yet, so I don't want to say for sure this is how it'll be. Um, but uh, yeah, the conversations that uh, that I've had with Akanite so far about the rest of the trilogy are um, that uh, it'll be historical setting and sort of carrying on the story from the first book. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't want to say too much about it because I don't want to scoop uh, announcements right, that are right. coming fairly soon. But uh, yeah, that's um, 
that's how it's envisioned is is uh, definitely the um to maintain that that historical period um and uh but i think uh it's interesting because it's it's a fairly recent historical period so it um it does sort of um has the potential to kind of bring us up into the 20th century right and and uh start thinking about things like the animus and and how we we got get to that so yeah it's it's uh i think the door is kind of open there in some regard but uh so far yeah no plans to write about uh to write about the modern period uh okay. at all and that, that gives me a good transition um, about the historical period itself. So from the descriptions that Akanai has put out, um, mm -hmm. the trilogy itself, um, starting from what we had with the Great Ex Exhibition uh, mm -hmm. at the beginning of uh, the Magus Conspiracy, um, the trilogy for the Engine of History is set to go up through the beginning of World War I. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. yeah i think that's that's out there in the internet somewhere so i think it's it's within the bounds of what i can, can say yes to so, I, I believe yeah. i have seen it in official like on the yeah. on the transmedia website and aconite's description um, yeah. about the trilogy going up to world war one um, yeah and but that's, that, that's kind of how it was envisioned you know when i talked about how when they sort of came to me with this period um, that was that was kind of the vision is you know from mid 19th century to World War One in that mm -hmm. period somehow. Okay, mm -hmm. and are you avoiding well known periods in that time frame like um, Russia during World War One mm -hmm. with Rasputin because I I feel like more recently and it's it's a trend that I see in media video games mm -hmm. books movies um, where everybody likes to focus on what is what is the hit thing right now? Like most mm -hmm. recently with the Assassin's Creed Valhalla and Vikings from the history channel, um, you know, Vikings were the big thing. Uh, and mm -hmm. my first thought when I think about, Assass or about Assassin's Creed and world war one, um, I know that we did have a graphic novel, um, with Assassin's Creed conspiracy that took place in that era. If I'm not mistaken, it may have been world war ii um but we did have um a character uh uh head the assassin's creed russia series um mm -hmm. which um you know would be interesting to see tie-ins like that i know you do have mm -hmm. cameos from some of the games uh mm -hmm. in your book um not mentioning any names because of course it's always a fun surprise to see them come up mm -hmm. um but is that something that you you look at trying to avoid and in, in depicting other historical settings that people may not know a lot about you know avoiding rasputin maybe telling more about the uh you know like the Khmer war um or things like that mm -hmm. yeah it's it's uh always a little bit of a dance for sure because um yeah i think uh, sometimes the interesting stories are in the parts that that haven't been told as often and uh so there are things that draw me to them um, but then at the same time, <clears throat> there's, um, you know, there's a lot of value in sort of, you know, having some familiar touchstones or touchstones as well that, that people can say, oh, yes, okay, uh, I was waiting for this person to show up, you know, or something like that. So there's a, a sense of you kind of have an expectation uh, to a degree, um, you know, and I, I wrestled with that a little bit with, with um, uh, my novel, The Embroidered Book, because that's, that's a historical fantasy about Marie Antoinette. Uh, and of course, you know, my first thought when I had the idea was, oh my God, Marie Antoinette's been written about so many times, uh, but um, not in the way that I did it. And, and uh, but then, you know, there's only so much room for one of those really big, well-known historical figures. And, and I kept thinking, you know, Catherine the Great is off to the side in this book and, and I can't really let her on because then she would take over. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> so, so there's only, I think there's only room for, you know, um, so many of those really well-known um, events and figures. Uh, and I think the same is really true in, in the Megas conspiracy that we have Ada Lovelace at the beginning. And um, she's, you know, probably not as well-known as she should be, but, but she's fairly well-known. And of course, being Lord Byron's daughter, you know, she's kind of a celebrity. And um, so she kind of takes up a lot of room uh, in that way. And, and she looms over the entire novel, of course, and, and her legacy. Um, so there aren't, that many other really um you know fig historical figures who are known to that extent in the rest of the book and and the few people who do crop up tend to be um, a little bit less well known um you know unless they're just walking on for a small part like uh, like the emperor in in vienna right right mm -hmm. um 
So uh, I was trying to do some research. Do you have an audiobook version coming out? And if mm -hmm. so, um, who who is actually doing the recording for it, if you're able to say? Yeah, it is uh, recorded books. And let me just, um, I'm trying to remember the uh, the narrator's name. It's just gone out of my head. But uh, yeah, but anyway, if you if you look it up, the uh, there is a, a recorded books version. And uh, I believe it's slated to come out on August 16th, um, which is the, uh, you know, the same day as the U.S. paperback. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, and it's coming, it's available through Audible and, and Libro and, and all those sorts of places. Okay. Okay. That's good. Um, okay. And uh, so I know uh, you have received a lot of feedback from early reviews and such, um, but I know in some of your previous interviews, you'd notice how nervous you were You're working with this tie-in for the first time. How are you feeling now after all the feedback you've received? Uh, really great. Really relieved. Yeah, <laughs> it's nice. It's nice that, uh, you know, the initial uh, feedback from people who, who know and love the games um, has been really positive. And, um, you know, that's that's really nice to see. Um, you know, of course, it's reviews are for the readers and, and not the author. So, you know, I, right. I, try to, I try to separate myself from them um, to some extent. But um, it has been really nice, the, the things that people have tagged me in and, and uh, said directly to me about the book. Um, and it's been, uh, yeah, it's really gratifying that um, people sort of um, have welcomed it into the canon and see um, how it fits in. Um, yeah, because it is a little bit nerve wracking uh, coming into something that is so <clears throat> beloved and so um you know uh, so widespread that uh so many people have played these games uh so you sort of feel like uh you know timidly knocking on the door saying like here's here's my offering and, <laughs> you right. know you just ho hope that uh ho hope that it's okay and that you don't break anything you know um so but and i feel um you know it's been it's been a great experience to uh you know to, to write the story and i feel I feel a lot of ownership over it, you know, like, like, you know, even though it's, it's an Assassin's Creed story, it, um, I feel very proud of it and, and how it, it worked out and sort of blended together what I like to do in fiction and, uh, what I think the, the game universe, uh, does so well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. okay. So here, here's a fun one. Who would be your ideal casting for your main characters? Oh my goodness. I haven't even thought of this. Um, Hmm. Who would be good? Oh, I'm trying to think. I don't know. I have such a. I'm terrible when it comes to. I'm terrible <laughs> when it comes to casting actors. I don't know. I'm trying to think if there's anyone who's really. Um, I can't think of a simian, although I feel like there there could be the perfect person, and I'll think of them as soon as I hang up this call. Um, mm -hmm. With Pierrette, I don't know. With Pierrette, I mean, she's she starts out quite young. I mean, maybe Millie Bobby Brown. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I could see that. I yeah, see that. I don't I'm know. Also, Did you have anyone in your head? I'm thinking now that I'm thinking about it. Um, let me see if I can grab her name real quick. She was in. She was in. Um, Game of Thrones and is set to be in The Last of Us uh, TV series, but Bella Ramsey, uh, who's set to play Elle, um, I think yeah. she could be a good – because she's one of those up-and-coming younger yeah. actors. Um, that that could be somebody good as well, but um, I, I yeah. always like to think about that. You know, Who did you have in mind when you were describing – or when you were writing this or creating this original character, um, you yeah. know, or you know, who do you think about when you play them? Because I always visualize, um, yeah. and usually with the, the amazing cover art um, that's on yeah. the book, um, you know, that always helps. But, you know, knowing what somebody looks like, and thankfully for historical figures, we have that freedom mm -hmm. but for some of the originals it's like who who am i thinking you know would simeon be more of a uh uh like a eddie redmayne or a, you know mm -hmm. are we thinking something more like a a younger channing tatum or you know just various different you know yeah people that have played soldiers in the past you know yeah it's interesting because he's so you know i was just thinking because i'm i started watching taboo which has uh tom hardy in it and and mm -hmm. he's so good and he's um uh, you know he plays uh um a returning sailor of, of roughly the same time period and um but i think he's got he's got a kind of an edge to him and i think um 
I, I see Simeon as, um, you know, even though he's kind of closed down and, and somewhat cynical, I think he's got a sort of a spark of, of innocence uh, in him as well and a spark of, um, you know, really goodwill. And so I don't know, like maybe someone like Andrew Garfield, maybe? I don't know. I could see that, yeah. yeah. Especially with what he did in Hacksaw Ridge. Um, I think mm-hmm. that, that could be a good fit. You know, it gives a, a good idea. So, yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll wait for the fan cast because right, sure right. Someone Maybe that's something we idea. could we could end up putting out. We can do a fan cast of uh of uh the Megas yeah. conspiracy. So yeah, and Kane yeah. would be fun to cast. I can. Oh yes, Kane. Kane really would happen. definitely be fun to cast. Mm-hmm. Um. Anyways, I do want to thank you for your time uh, in uh, in joining us for this interview. Um, the book uh, comes out here in August, and then in the UK in October. Mm-hmm. Um. And it's it's a fantastic read. I think it's a great start to the trilogy. Um, I know myself and a lot of the other community members are looking forward to the second book and the third book, of course, and just seeing what is happening next with this story. Um, but uh, I, I think it's going to be a, a very popular one to go alongside with all of the other books that Aconite has been pushing out um, that are all kind of hitting that same kind of criteria of – great interesting unique stories that are separated from the series but integrate extremely well into them great thank you so much this has been uh, lots of fun and my nervous says goodbye (laughs) (laughs) all right well thank you again for joining us thank you